today, Florida's fighting back. Florida sues to sail cruises. To remove the conditional sailing order for cruise ships. A major South Florida industry trying to stay afloat. We do not want the cruise industry to be singled out. As one cruise line threatens to leave U.S. water. The curfew will be lifted next Monday. One county lifts curfew. We can't keep the business community closed. Another plans for reopening, but COVID concerns remain for South Florida. The big news of the week and the newsmakers all live this week in South Florida. Good morning. Welcome. Glad you could join us. I'm Michael Putney. I'm Glenna Milberg. We launch today into the controversy over cruising with so much at stake for South Florida. This week, Florida via, via Governor Ron DeSantis sued the CDC over new cruising guidelines and also lack of a restart date. At Port Miami on Friday afternoon, a wide array of bipartisan elected officials, cruise line executives, union leaders all gathered to speak with one voice about the need to start cruising again, hopefully by July. And one Miami-based cruise line is threatening to possibly start sending its ships out from ports in other more receptive countries. That cruise line is Carnival with its world headquarters right here in Miami. Christine Duffy is the president and she is with us as you see live. Christine Duffy, welcome. Great to have you. Christine, welcome. We are glad to see you. Good morning. Thank you for having me. Okay, it's great to have you here. All right, let's begin with sort of the most basic question, which is, on Friday afternoon, you and your uh, uh, contemporaries from every other major cruise line said, we need to get our ships back out there. We need to get back to work. 60,000 or so workers directly, indirectly affected here in South Florida at Port Miami. How are you going to do that by July? Well, that's really why we are engaging and so appreciative of the bipartisan support that we're receiving to restart cruising. So that's really the ask at this point. And we are engaging with our federal government as well as the CDC to uh, lift the current conditional sale order that was issued last October. That came with, Christine Duffy, a, a number of uh, stipulations, if you will. The CDC is in sort of a public sense framing what it thinks is a healthy way, a safe way to start cruising. And this Friday gathering was kind of a, a blowback to that. Can you talk a little bit about wh what is wrong with the CDC recommendations and stipulations and standards, which right now sort of sets the standard for when cruises can restart? Well, we believe that the current uh, conditional sale order, first of all, was issued last October before there were vaccines. We had been working with the CDC to look at restart of cruising once we had testing available and we began to better understand COVID and how to protect and prevent. We have been sailing in other parts of the world since last June. Over 400,000 uh, people have taken cruises everywhere but outside, but the U.S. So right now the conditional sale order does not reflect vaccines and there's also a great deal of information that has not yet been communicated to the cruise lines from what will be required for test cruises what kind of testing may be required so we really just don't have the details uh, or transparency or engagement with cdc that we need to begin sailing by this summer, which is such uh, an important season for the cruise industry and for uh, vacationers. Yeah, uh, Christine Duffy, you seem to be saying the CDC is sort of dragging its feet, not going as fast as you and the cruise industry would like. Is that accurate? Well, we re respect certainly the CDC and the work that they are doing at a much broader scale. But at the same time, the cruise industry, as far as we know, is the only industry um, that has not been able to operate for more than a year when we voluntarily paused last March. And we have worked together as an industry uh, to develop layers of protection and um, provided the CDC with recommendations that we collectively agreed to as cruise lines so that we could restart sailing. And so we're asking now for the CDC to work with us 
so that we can have clarity on what will be required to resume sailing from our U.S. home ports. All right, if I could follow up, Christine, with just uh, an important question. As you know, the day before your news conference, Governor Ron DeSantis was at Port Miami, and he said he did not believe that the cruise lines should be required to have their passengers give proof that they had been vaccinated before they get on board your ships. Where does Carnival stand? Will you require passengers on Carnival ships to show proof of vaccination or to be uh, uh, proved negative before they get on board? We are not making those decisions as a cruise line. We do not believe that the cruise industry in the U.S. should be treated any differently than other forms of travel, tourism, or entertainment. And so at this time, people are able to get on a plane and fly outside of the U.S., take a cruise, and come back into the U.S. Um, without requirements like a vaccine or a health passport. So our position is don't treat cruise industry differently than everyone else. We have put together a set of protocols that we believe give uh, prevention protection. Uh, and as I said, we've demonstrated in other parts of the world that we've been able to, to sail safely even before vaccines. So you make a, a fair point when you compare cruise liners to other forms of entertainment. But then cruise liners are so different than other forms of entertainment in that there's a, a residential component, especially three days, seven days, 10 days. People, a lot of people are living together in close quarters, sharing a lot of public spaces uh, as if, well, they do live aboard. And that's not something that you can compare to a casino or an airplane or a hotel. So, so the CDC is, what it appears from reading the standards is it's treating cruise liners like a residence. And, and as such, th there is a, a CDC guideline prior to COVID that, that you actually, in, I read a report from last September, really backed the CDC's guidance. So what's changed? Well, first of all, vaccines have changed. What's also changed is the treatments and therapies that are available today for COVID. And certainly a year ago, when we put our pause in place, there was great concern about the capacity in hospitals if there was a spread of the virus. And while you say that we are different than a casino, because most cause large casinos have hotels uh, in the casino building, um, people are gathered together. And we have addressed some of those concerns around crowding by saying that we will limit our capacity at the point of restart so that we will be able to uh, support any physical distancing requirements that are needed. We've not really heard back specifically, again, on what the protocols will be for people when they take a cruise. Yeah. Christine, as we know, there are cruises that are operating out of Asia, out of the Mediterranean. These are not U.S. owned cruise lines, and they appear to be doing OK. There have not been huge outbreaks of coronavirus on board these ships. If you find the CDC to be so recalcitrant and so difficult, would you, would Carnival consider basing more of its ships in other countries? Well, I've always said Carnival Cruise Line is America's cruise line. We sail from 14 U.S. home ports around the U.S. A large percentage of our guests actually drive to their cruise vacation and can do so in five hours or less. So we really do not want to have to move our ships out of U.S. home ports. Um, there are several cruise lines that have already begun doing that because at some level, we will have no choice if we can't gain clarity and alignment on what it will take to restart cruising from the U.S. But what doesn't make sense is that somebody can get on a plane, book a, a cruise out of the Caribbean for June, fly to that cruise, take the cruise, and come right back into the U.S. Carnival has 14 home ports, its world headquarters in Miami. Why aren't the ships themselves registered in the United States? Well, the cruise industry is uh, 
we are registered, our ships are registered in various countries. Um, that's been a uh, the way that the cruise industry has always operated because we move around in international waters. And so our regulation comes under the International Maritime Organization. Yeah, uh, very briefly, Christine, let me ask you, Governor DeSantis is suing the CDC. Does Carnival support that lawsuit uh, by the state of Florida? Well, that is really up to the governor. We appreciate Governor DeSantis's support and I think his frustration because we do have a sense of urgency that we need clarity in order to restart sailing if we're gonna be able to do so this summer. And so we know that there are other governors, um, there are other places, the state of Alaska, um, the governor there has also announced that they are looking into a lawsuit because in Alaska, most of the tourists that they get come by cruise ships. Yeah. So this is not limited to Florida. Florida and certainly South Florida is um, the cruise capital of the world where we have more ships and more guests that are uh, embarking here. And it is tied to many, many jobs in this community. And so putting the cruise lines aside, I think the focus and the concern that the governor and other representatives who you saw Friday at the Port of Miami is that we need to get people back to work here. And yeah. that's why we are asking we uh, at them. this time. We, we heard you and we heard them loud and clear at the port on Friday. Christine Duffy, great to speak with you and good luck with getting your ships back at sea again. Thanks so much. Thank you. That news conference we've been talking about at Port Miami on Friday, it was organized by Miami's freshman congresswoman. Representative Maria Salazar was responsible for bringing that group together and we will speak with her next. The coalition demanding a restart of cruising from U.S. ports includes cruise line CEOs, longshoremen, politicians, Democrats, and Republicans. And that was arranged by the Miami Congresswoman, whose district includes Port Miami, Maria Salazar, with us live today to talk cruising and a lot more. Good morning, Congresswoman. Congresswoman, good morning. Great to How see you. How are you? Good. My pleasure. You were at that press conference, so wonderful to see you again, Michael. Thank, thank you very much. Uh, well, let's talk, let me just say, it was pretty remarkable that you got all the, this wide ranging group of Democrats, Republicans, longshoremen, corporate executives, everybody got together and spoke with one voice. And what is the message that you are sending to the CDC? Well, um, we're all Americans and we all live in South Florida and we need to revive this industry. And the message is that the cruise line industry needs to be treated fairly, period. If the planes are full of people, if the hotels are full of tourists, if there are casinos open for people to enjoy, if uh, you have gyms and you have planes and trains, how come you cannot have passengers boarding those cruise ships and uh, and that is it's not only that is not fair the way they have been treated but also is that the CDC has not answered for months our request and let me explain to you and you know I, I like my little my little uh, notes here look what the look what the uh, the C, the stakeholders at the uh, cruise line industry are willing to do they're willing to vaccinate every passenger they're willing every worker that works on those cruise ships to be vaccinated as well. They are willing to limit capacity to 60% and everyone in that cruise ship needs to wear a mask. That's pretty good. Tell me where else could you go any other venue where you're gonna be surrounded by people that are, have been vaccinated or the workers have been vaccinated. So there's something wrong here, Michael. There's something wrong and the CDC needs to wake up and understand that for South Florida, this is a major engine, economic engine. I'm gonna to explain to you why. It produces 8 million passengers coming to District 27 to South Florida. Those 8 million passengers produce $9 billion in direct spending. That's a lot of money for District 27. 160,000 jobs and 30% of those proceeds, the total spending goes to the small business community. Okay, there's That's why a, you elected me, for me a, to go work. There's a lot to unpack there. 
Congresswoman, to, uh, let's, all, let's all stipulate we are on the same page. This is a major economic engine for South Florida as a whole, Port Miami, Port Everglades, Port yes. of Key West. Uh, no dispute there whatsoever. Devil is in the details. So let's unpack that a little bit. Um, let's talk about vaccines right. first. A lot, we've heard a lot of the cruise line. I'm not sure you were able to hear our last segment with Carnival's president, Christine Duffy, talked a little bit yeah, about vaccinations. Cruise lines are willing to make sure all the passengers and workers are vaccinated, but with the governor's executive order that there will be no way for businesses to ask for any kind of what, what's called a vaccine passport. How do you, if, if that's the avenue and that's what's gonna make people safe and, and perceived to be safe, how do you sort of bridge that gap between requiring vaccines, but there's no proof that the vaccines have been done? Because I think what the governor wants to do is to wake up the CDC. I think that's exactly what we all want to do. We want the stakeholders from the cruise line industry, the executives to be sitting at a table with the CDC administrators and reach an agreement of what are the guidelines. And I'm sure that Governor DeSantis will be fine with that. It's just having treat this industry the same way we have treated the planes, the air, airlines, the trains, the casinos, the hotels, all the other industry that surrounds tourism in South Florida. Although, I as think we talked that's about, the although as we talked about in the last segment, th this is not the same kind of setting. This is a, and mm -hmm. the CDC actually considers cruise ships residential congregant setting. I mean, people live there for a while. But what about a hotel? People are living under that same roof, and a hotel is the same thing. And you can only, and you can get. Uh, you can get the virus within 50 minutes. Look at the planes. When, you, when I go to Washington, I'm surrounded by people. Yeah, they're wearing masks, but it's the same type of environment. Think about it. So if the, uh, if the stakeholders and the cruise line executives are telling us that they are willing to require everyone that gets on those ships to be vaccinated and the workers that they will look for the vaccines and they will vaccinate everybody that works on those ships. Don't you think that at least the CDC should be sitting at the table negotiating with them? But they're not. Yeah. Congressman Jimenez, uh, we were, and he shared that at the press conference, had a very heated conversation with the CDC administrators, top echelon, and they were not considering the possibility of this vaccination that's happening right now. You why know, do they you, need why to do you wake think up. that is? And this is one of, why, why do you yeah, think that is? That well, be? because you see, we have found out that in Washington, you have the, private, the public sector sometimes doesn't work at the speed of business. And that's what I was telling Carlos at the press conference that we're going to, in my office, my congressional office in Washington, we're going to call once again on Monday and Tuesday. But on Wednesday, I'm going to cross the street and I'm going to knock on their door and tell them, I think you should be paying attention to us, to Jimenez, to Salazar, and to the cruise industry. You know why? Because we're here to, wear, to work and to fight for those union workers. Yeah who haven't worked for 13 months and they do not want a handout. They just want a hand up. They want a job and go back to the port and earn a living. Yeah. Well, and why we, are we, have, we allowing them to do that? Yeah. Well, I, I think that in fact, if you go knock on the door of the CDC and you and Con Congressman Jimenez and diaz Ballard and others go, and it is a really bipartisan issue, it, it, it may well make a difference. Uh, Congresswoman, let's move on to another really big topic that concerns you, and that is immigration. Uh, a tremendous crisis down at the border uh, of Mexico and the U.S. Uh, at the present time, apparently they have 19,000 uh, immigrant children who, are, who have just arrived this month. Uh, you have a plan for immigration. You call it the Dignity Plan. Give us a summary. What, what is your plan? My plan is to give dignity to those people who have been here in this country for more than five years. We, the Hispanic Americans, we have a major problem with what's happening at the border, not only the rest of the American public. And why do I single out the Hispanics? Because we're in the middle. 
We are hostages to the Washington politicians who have been promising for 35 years, don't you worry, we are going to give you that path to citizenship. That's on one side. And on the other side, we have the coyotes trafficking with the children. So what's happening right now is that the urgency happening at the border is overshadowing the importance of giving some type of legality to those people who have lived here, who do not have a criminal record, who have American children, who have paid taxes, who are working, and who want to just remain and just go home for Christmas. Yeah, and well, they don't want I, anything if, else. If, so if that's I why may, I created a dignity plan. Yeah, all right. Yeah, if dignity. I may interrupt, the, uh, excuse me. The, Tell me. The House of Representatives, where you serve, uh, before you got there, passed an immigration reform bill it covers the dreamers and all kinds of other things. It went over to the Senate. It has died in the Senate. So there seems to be a good faith effort uh, in Washington, at least on the House side, uh, to move something forward. It's stalled in the Senate. You see, but that's a fallacy, Michael. I'm going to explain to you why. Because, and I am going to be a news reporter, not a congresswoman of the Republican Party. When you present, and Nancy Pelosi presented two weeks ago or a month ago, the DACA and the agricultural workers, what's happening in between? Yes, you're going to give some type of legality to the DACA and to the DREAMers, but what happens with the TPS? And what happens with those millions and millions of people who have been here more than five years, who do not have, a, uh, have not committed a crime, who have American children. Actually, let me just, can I, can I interrupt you for one minute? I just a little fact check here. The, the act that passed in the House does provide people who are here under TPS with a path to legality. Yeah. The, two weeks ago, we voted on DACA on the agricultural workers. A TPS is That's in there. That's it, and but, you know why? Excuse me? T TPS is actually a component of that bill. And, and you were one of only the nine. The DACA. You were only one of only nine uh, GOP House members, including all of the GOP representatives from South Florida who voted for that bill. And, and so. Yeah, but. Uh, and yes, it's a okay, the job GPS, to the rest of your colleagues around the country. It, but it, listen, let, let's concentrate on what's happening. You have millions of people still in the middle with no answer. So I don't, I, I, I don't want to just settle for, yeah, we took care of 1.8, and then, yeah, the agriculture is another 900,000. We're talking about 11 million plus who have been here for more than five years. It's true that they broke the law. It's true that they should not be here, but, you know, the system allowed them to stay. And that since the system allowed them to stay for 5, 10, 15 years, then we have to all sit at the table. We're all guilty, if that's the way you want to put it, and give them some legality. Representative, right? but also I, we have to understand. Hold your thought me. just a second. We've got to take a break. I mean, you were in this business for a long time. You know, we have to run a few ads here, and we'll come back and speak with you in just a minute. BRB. <laughs> We are back with Congresswoman Maria Salazar talking about immigration and Congresswoman, your plan uh, in the short time that we have together for a very long topic. And by the way, appreciate you bringing your own graphics. That is so key. <laughs> um, so <laughs> your dignity, the dignity plan, which you've been outlining, why do you think that has any better chances to pass than all of the other immigration bills that have been spearheaded by Republicans in South Florida in sessions past that got stuck because the only real bipartisan vote on immigration seems to be in South Florida. How does the dignity plan, how will that fare any better? I think that is a great question and only God can answer that one. I'm trying my best. I'm telling the GOP that we need to attract the Hispanics in this world, in this country. We're 20 percent of the population. We need to attract God-fearing, law-abiding, tax-paying, hard-working people that share the same values that are entrenched in the Republican Party. We do not want to hand out. We want to hand up. 
And so I need to, as a, as a Hispanic, Latina, brown girl from the hood, from Little Havana, and very proud of it, knowing that the American system is the best system in the world, all I can say to my party is join me in welcoming the Hispanics to the GOP. Because we share, I repeat, we share the same values. But the thing is that right now, both parties have forgotten and I go back to the Democrats. The Democrats have been promising the Hispanics for 35 years path to citizenship. That is not possible right now. Neither Hispanics don't want to wait for, for path. They want legality. They want dignity. And that is what I want to give them. 10 years where they can come out of the shadows, they can pay taxes, they can buy homes, they can raise their American children, and they can go home for, uh, for Christmas or bury their dead and come back. Yeah. And if they want to, after 10 years, to become American citizens, then they can go into the redemption path. Yeah. And after five years, then you can obtain your citizenship. You know, Ronald Reagan was the last guy who gave legality to three million Mexicans in 1986. You know how many people applied for citizenship at the time? 30%. Because in reality, the overwhelming number of Hispanics, the illegal ones, do not necessarily want to wait for path. They want dignity now. And that is what I'm, I'm crossing. And now I go back to Washington tomorrow, and I'm going to talk to my Democrat fellow congressmen and women and tell them, hey, join me. Republicans and Democrats working for Browns and Hispanics right, in this country. I hope and I wish you well with that. Uh, let me, Thank in, you. The couple of minute, in the couple of minutes left, I need to ask you, uh, as you are well aware, on Friday night, Congressman Matt Gates, fellow Republican from Florida up in the panhandle, was out at the Trump National Doral speaking to a women's group, the same group that sponsored the big rally on the ellipse on January 6th. He said that he has been subject to a smear, the lying media, deep state is after him because the FBI is apparently looking into him for having sex with a 17-year-old girl, all these other things, the House Ethics Committee also looking into him. Uh, what is your opinion of Congressman Gates? Should he uh, simply sit back and, and let the investigation go on because, you know, he is out there loud and proud. There is an investigation going on. Let's wait for the investigation and let's see the results. And the results will speak for themselves. Whatever and whomever that is found guilty of those charges that the investigation is imposing on my Congress, uh, fellow congressman, Mr. Getz, um, uh, it uh, needs to then pay, and the full, the full weight of the law needs to fall on his, on his head. I am not going to uh, pass judgment right now. We've got to wait for the investigation, but no one is above the law in this country, and much less with that type of charges. Well, that is a good point on which to end. Always great to have you, uh, Congresswoman Maria Elvira Salazar. Thank you. And Always. As Glenna thank you. said, thank you thank for you, bringing Glenna. your own graphics. <laughs> If, if you tell, you us, see? If you you tell us beforehand, we can make them really pretty and put them up while you talk. Just a pro tip there. But you see, my graphics, you see, I handle them. And I know, you know, I know you can make them too, but I know that these work. At least it conveys the info. For sure. Yep, Wonderful sure. to see you. Thank, thank you, Sam. Thank you very much. Take care. Up next, Miami-Dade's COVID curfews time has come. And we are going to start there with Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Levine Cava. She is next. A lot of people watching the clock right now, 12 hours from right now, just after midnight. Miami-Dade County will lift an almost year-long COVID curfew and restrictions on business. That comes despite concerning trends in the positive case rate and the number of hospitalizations. Miami-Dade Mayor Daniela Levine Cava issued this order lifting the curfew and she joins us now for her, from her home. Mayor Levine Cava, good afternoon. Great to see you. Very good to be with you. Thank you, good Michael afternoon. and Glenna. 
Yeah, you too, and um, and great to have you here today because the big question is, uh, you, you actually decided to do this last week, watching the days go by, finally got it done, we're counting the hours, but at the same time, uh, this, the sort of standards that you've set in place, below 5%, 14-day positivity rate average, that, that's kind of taken a turn, apparently, when you look at the graph. Is there a concern there that this may not be the time? So we have so many factors that we need to consider. Most important was the availability of vaccine. The fact is we're almost at a million shots. This is unprecedented. We are almost at, uh, well, we are at a third of the population. So we are making great, great progress and especially the most vulnerable. So those are the people over 65. We are at 75% have received the vaccine. So the population that is most vulnerable, most likely to get seriously ill and be hospitalized uh, is, is well on its way to, to protection. So we looked at a confluence of the circumstances together with Chief Medical Officer, Dr. Peter Page. We looked also at hospitalization. It, it is down. Uh, the serious hospitalization is down. And uh, of course, I am alarmed. The positivity is going up and it's on us. We need to continue to mask disinfect and socially distance. So along with the curfew change, we did issue changes to the guidelines and those went into effect already this past week. Uh, it simplifies things. Uh, it makes sure that everybody understands the basics and it does allow some loosening of things that now we know don't pose the greatest risk. So for example, if you're outside on a beautiful day like today so far, and you uh, are distanced 10 feet, you do not need to wear your mask outdoors if you are distanced. But you should have it on hand because there might come somebody closer into your orbit. Uh, also, uh, we now allow the, the spas and the locker rooms to open up, different things that can be done safely following these precautions. Yeah. Well, we know that your order uh, lifting the curfew also calls, as you say, for the uh, for uh, boats can raft up out there in the bay. Uh, yes. Gyms can open. Water stations can be turned on at golf courses, tennis courts uh, like the ones yes. I go to. Salad bars can open. Toothpicks can be dispensed. I, I mean, collectively, these are all good, I think, give us some confidence. But on the other hand, uh, Madam Mayor, Yesterday, the New York Times published a map from the CDC showing areas of deep concern in the country where COVID, coronavirus, is still fairly intense. And Southeast Florida is one of those areas. So how do you yes. strike the right balance between reopening society and making sure that health and safety are a huge consideration? You, you said it, exactly that, how to balance. We have enjoyed relative openness in our society, and we have done relatively well compared also to the rest of the state. It is really critical that our businesses continue to monitor and maintain those safety guidelines, and I have to commend them. They have been outstanding over this difficult year in making sure that they adapted and took those precautions. And of course, it's on each of us. Uh, you know, I'm with folks all the time who've been vaccinated and they feel just a great sense of relief, but they also know there's still the possibility that they could contract it, maybe with uh, fewer symptoms, and there's also the possibility they could still transmit it. And our young people especially, they really are the ones now that we're counting on. Fortunately, everyone can get the vaccine. So we are really pushing that. We need our young people to step up, do it for themselves, for their loved ones, for the broader community. Mayor, I'd love to hear you weigh in on something we've been, everyone's been reporting on, complete with video of late night clubs who until today would have been violating the curfew. Mm -hmm. Nevertheless, besides the hour of the day or night, uh, we have just video, one really worried mom is emailing me yes. this week yeah. about, <laughs> about hundreds and, and in some cases, thousands of people packing clubs with no masks, having a great time, but with no masks and no social distancing. And now that the curfew is going away, those clubs are gonna be popping. Right. And, uh, and I really need you as the leader of this county to weigh in on that. And, and what, yeah. if, what does that all mean? 
Yeah, worried moms, I've been hearing from them too. And clearly we need to enforce. And uh, we do have a commitment from all of our municipalities and also our county, uh, both our police department and our code enforcement, they are on the scene. They are empowered, they are activated. We had meetings this past week with all of them to emphasize the importance of, of maintaining uh, those protections. Uh, by the way, these clubs that have sprung up, many of them to evade the curfew, exactly. Uh, clearly, we need to crack down. We need to go with the established places, the places that we know are conforming to the rules and uh, support them as they safely reopen. All right, Mayor Daniela Levine Keva, always good to speak with you. Sorry, we can't get into the cruise ship thing. You were there at the news conference on Friday speaking out for the resumption of cruising. We know you are all for that. Thanks very much just, for being, being, being with thank us. Thank you. If I could just say, you're going to hear from us this week. We're coming forward with some proposals to the CDC. Thank Excellent. you. Excellent. All right, we're, we're on text. <laughs> <laughs> Take care. Thanks. All right, as Miami Dade prepares to lift its curfew, Broward plans to reopen as well. Mayor Steve Geller is live with us next. Broward County, like Miami-Dade, is trying to find the right balance between opening up its economy and keeping its people safe from COVID. It is a delicate balance, especially under the governor's executive orders that prevent counties from enforcing its own COVID safety rules. Broward Mayor Steve Geller joins us now live. Good morning, Ma oh, good afternoon, Mayor. <laughs> Mr. Mayor, welcome. Great to see you. Welcome. Michael. So uh, I'm hoping that you heard our last segment with Miami Dade's mayor, Daniela Levine Cava. And, um, you know, t we're one big South Florida megalopolis. So all of the same issues are facing you. Um, I pulled your letter that you wrote to more than a dozen people at the CDC and Health and Human Services uh, yes. talking about Broward's three phased approach. Phase one looks like sort of just lifting the social distancing and capacity limits mostly on different places. But, um, you know, the, the standards by which you have set out, we're a month at least away from that, no? Nope. Um, well, <laughs> maybe. The, um, what we decided to do in Broward is to try and come up with objective metrics-based uh, criteria for when we should reopen, not just picking an arbitrary date. I contacted the North and South Broward Hospital Districts. I contacted Johns Hopkins. I contacted uh, the CDC, HHS. I spoke with Dr. Anthony Fauci, trying to come up with criteria. The best that we could do was this three-phased approach, um, which is as most scientific-based as we could get. Uh, the problem, as you mentioned, is that we're having problems enforcing our orders. And the, the numbers uh, that we came up with were that once we're below 5% using Florida's phony way of counting, um, and we reached a 50% positivity rate. Can, can you just, I, I just yeah. can't let that go without, yeah. can, what do you mean phony way of counting? There, there has been no evidence that Florida's count is phony, no hard evidence at all. Of course there has been. Um, and let me tell, and there have been, uh, the Sun Sentinel wrote about it. There have been TV. When I say phony way of counting, I'm not saying that the data has been fudged. What I'm saying is they just count differently than any other state, at least any other state that I found. There's two legitimate ways of counting. You've got one that the World Health Organization and the CDC uses, which is you count the total number of people. If you test 100 people and seven people have it, then it's 7% positive. There's a second way that Johns Hopkins uses, which is you count the total number of people taking the test for the first time only. And then you see how many of those are positive. Florida counts, and this is accurate, Florida counts if you can test negative five times, they'll count all five negatives, but they'll only count one positive. So Florida is the only state that I believe that counts that way. It is not a method that either CDC or World Health Organization or Johns Hopkins recognizes all right, all right. as a legitimate well, measure. Steve Geller, let me just stop you and just say on Friday, according right. to the State Department of Health, 
Broward's positivity rate was 6.7 percent, and I believe yesterday it was about 7 percent. I think the larger issue is whether those are absolutely accurate or not, is that if you really want to reopen yeah. society, you, you say you want the rate to be about 5 percent or less. How yes. are you going to get there? Well, the way we're getting there, remember, it's a two-part test. One is based on, when we reopen, is based on the vaccination rate. We have vaccinated in Broward County over 35% of the adults in Broward. Uh, what I've said is that the first part of phase one would be when we've achieved a 50% uh, adult vaccination rate. We are currently vaccinating at about 1% per day. So in two or three weeks, will have reached a 50% adult vaccination rate, probably closer to three weeks than two. Um, and at that point in time, we'd be able to enter phase one. And if the rate were going, phase two for vaccination rates would be another less than two weeks. The problem is when are we going to get below the numbers? I can't tell you. Um, I'm hoping it's gonna be quick. And that's why we have metric based numbers. If you look at the way that Johns Hopkins measures and the CDC also recognizes that as a legitimate one, uh, which is first test only, uh, they recommend CDC says you should be below nine. Johns Hopkins says you should be below 10. As of yesterday, I haven't seen today's numbers. We were just over 40. So let me let so, me ask you. Let me ask you yeah. this. When you lay all this out, you had said that you have been contacting the CDC. Yes. That you are not get with with what you call you want to do science based decisions, yes. which I'm sure they're all for. So you had said you're not getting specific answers to your questions. They're not addressing your questions. Which ones is the CDC not addressing? When I sent them the letter this followed a conversation that we had with 10 people from cdc four people from ushhs the chief epidemiologist of the state of florida and a dr paula thatchy who is the director of the florida department of health in broward the 16 of us were on the phone along with me and my staff and i asked specific questions based on the letter saying when can we open this when can we open that Johns Hopkins did respond get with some valuable input. CDC said, well, look at our guidelines. Yeah, Mr. And Mayor, when I'm, you look, I, I did look at their guidelines and they, they do Mr. have a Mayor, chart out. And that's the numbers I mentioned. Yeah. I'm sorry, Michael. I, I, I'm sorry to interrupt. I apologize. We are out of time. We will come back to this, have you back and talk about how you are finding the fine balance between safety and opening up society. Steve. And Michael, let me just say 10 words. We re voted to reopen almost everything outdoors and are hoping to reopen quickly. Thank you, Michael. We'll Thank talk you. again. Thank, Thank you so much. Thank you very much. All right. We'll be right back. Before we leave you today, a very brief and personal perspective about the late Congressman Elsie Hastings and the cufflinks that I am wearing. Here they are, great looking. The seal of the U.S. House of Representatives. Congressman Hastings gave me these cufflinks after he appeared on this show about 15 years ago. I was initially taken aback. I said, hey, I'm a reporter. I can't take gifts from people I cover, especially a politician. He smiled and said to me, Michael, these aren't from Congressman Hastings. These are from Al C. to Michael. So I kept them. So glad that I did. I am wearing them today in honor of Al C. Hastings. Never expected or asked for anything in return. These were a gift from one friend to another. He was a gift. I will miss him wearing these cufflinks today in honor of Al C. Hastings. May he rest in peace. Thank you for being with us. We are online 24-7. <laughs> At where? <laughs> Local10.com. Great to be with you this Sunday. And as always, stay informed, get involved. Have a good Sunday.